certainly took her a long time. Let's hope she really works for that bread and butter from now on. The part already played, and the part still being played by the French forces of the interior, is one of the outstanding features in the situation in France today. Armed by the Allies at the right time, and with new weapons to add to their own collection, the Maki, secretly trained and disciplined for their D-Day, have even exceeded all estimates of the help expected from them. We in Britain knew that they were only waiting the order to rise and kill the Bosch, but we could scarcely count on their overwhelming so many towns and whole departments of France so swiftly. Their greatest glory was in Paris, but all over France, the men and women of the Maquis have been terrific. In Chartres, for example, you see them in action alongside Americans during the liberation of that city. They helped to clear out the last of the German snipers, and they helped in rounding up the last Germans to surrender there. And by the way, it wouldn't appear that the Bosch had greatly endeared himself to the people of Chartres. The Maki, here as elsewhere all over France, had rounded up the collaborationists too. A batch of women with shaven heads had associated with enemy troops, but such people were few in number, and here, by way of contrast, here is the real France, the Maki, and the canteen workers looking after them. In fact, the whole organization of an underground army now very much on the surface. So rapidly has victory swept across France that the liberation of Chartres seems almost long ago, but that's only an illusion created by such a volume of success. While they were running up victory flags in Chartres, while General Patton's high-speed columns were slashing deeper into the country, a colossal mopping up was going on in the north. The Canadians closed the Falaise pocket at Trump. The 1st Canadian Army and their comrades from the United Kingdom, our magnificent 2nd Army, had been fighting with the greatest skill and resolution against the elite of Hitler's divisions on the Western Front. The German 7th Army had been decisively defeated. Part of it had bolted though it has not escaped, and now the remainder was being chopped up by the Allies' mincing machine. Artillery, tanks, aircraft and infantry, all together were slashing and slicing the pride of the Wehrmacht in a relentless engagement from which, for the Hun, there was now no way out. German armour was pounded and smashed and burnt. German armour and German manpower were now herded into killing areas. One of these was near Saint-Lambert, here, the invincible world conquerors found themselves in a slaughterhouse. For every man who chose surrender, it is reported that two at least were killed. And quite an early reckoning put the surrenders at 50,000. Surrounded, stunned and bewildered, many were captured like this officer, who drove straight into a trap when he thought he was driving out of the pocket. Everywhere, it was a case of surrender or be killed. 50,000 prisoners from the pocket, and that's by no means the final count. The total included many of Hitler's very best, the fanatical SS troops, still convinced, no doubt, that the catastrophic Battle of Normandy was a great victory for Hitler. And then, of course, there were the ordinary cannon fodder, many of whom are reported to have agreed that Germany has already lost the war. And there were oddities, a few at any rate, like this veteran. How old would you say? Fifteen, perhaps? And some Mongolians from the far eastern provinces of Russia. What were they doing in Normandy? You tell me, they seem to say. And then, then there was the man who rode in as if it were the end of a hard day's harvesting.
that the vast majority of prisoners were well-trained, hard-fighting Huns, beaten in battle by better men, their generals outwitted by ours. They've certainly got a lot to think about as prisoners. <laughs>